the lack of clarity around what regulations apply to Web3 infrastructure and unpredictable enforcement against entrepreneurs building decentralized protocols is holding back the growth of Web3 in the US. Hi, and welcome back to What Kind of Internet Do You Want? I'm Amy James, and today we're talking about the threat of regulatory uncertainty pushing Web3 out of the US. The United States has led the technology sector for the last 30 years. It generates as much annual revenue as the total gross domestic product of many countries in the European Union. In 2021, the combined revenue of just the five largest US tech companies, Meta, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and Microsoft was $1.39 trillion, which is greater than the entire individual GDPs of every EU nation, except for Germany, France, and Italy. And while it's easy to assume this will continue, ongoing regulatory uncertainty or worse, overly restrictive regulation and continued regulation through enforcement threaten this position. But before we start, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel, and let's get into it. Ongoing regulatory uncertainty has already been pushing Web3 builders out of the US. I've been in the industry since 2014, so I've seen the waves of companies moving over the years. First, Zug in Switzerland was the popular destination, and then Singapore, and lately it's been popular to form protocol management DAOs in the British Virgin Islands, Caymans, and Panama. Although the US has led the technology sector for more than 30 years, that doesn't mean it's guaranteed to do so forever. When Sir Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, he was at CERN in Switzerland, but he intentionally came to the US to advance the web's growth. The US has been the leader of both Web 1 and Web 2 because the regulatory landscape provided the framework that entrepreneurs and innovators needed to build businesses. But that's been changing. While the US was initially the leader of Web3 development, it's lost market share to India, China, Russia, and other emerging markets, dropping from a 47% share of the worldwide market to a 29% share since 2015. Web3 developer growth in the US is also slower than other countries, with the US increasing over the past four years by 200%, while the rest of the world increased by 300%. And because of signaling from the SEC that it considers the vast majority of cryptocurrency tokens to be securities, they can't be traded on US exchanges. So more than 95% of crypto trading activity happens on overseas exchanges. The danger is that Web3 infrastructure could be overlooked because so much of the attention and scandal has been from the financial services aspect of the industry. So well-intentioned but overly restrictive legislation could have the unintended consequence of making it illegal to build or use Web3 infrastructure in the US. And that is really concerning because these protocols are decentralizing the infrastructure of the web itself and will have a bigger impact on the daily lives of most web users than decentralized financial services. If the US wants to continue to be the leader of the technology industry and benefit from the potential trillions of dollars in growth from Web3, it needs to provide regulatory clarity that will foster the growth of Web3. So a couple of key issues that need to be addressed are creating a level playing field so that Web3 companies can compete fairly with Web2 incumbents, and also allowing for machine-to-machine token-controlled network orchestration. So let's talk about these issues in a little more detail. Here's an example of how Web3 needs a level playing field to compete with Web2. As a side effect of making these videos, we spend quite a bit of time using stock photo sites. And often when buying a stock photo from a Web2 company, we can't just use a credit or debit card to pay the price of the photo. We first have to buy a package of points from the stock photo site and then use those points to buy the photo that we want. And as you can imagine, it is not uncommon to have to buy more points than you need. So for instance, the points package may be sold in increments of 50, but the photo you want to buy is only 65 points, so you end up with 35 extra points that you don't need. 
Kind of like how hot dogs are sold in packs of 10 while hot dog buns are sold in packs of eight. <laughs> However, Web3 apps aren't allowed to sell users the tokens that they need to use their service. Many Web3 infrastructure protocols use tokens to incentivize and orchestrate the network, which means that users need tokens similar to the way they need stock photo points to pay for whatever it is that they want to buy, file storage, cloud processing, video transcoding, and the tokens are required for the network to be able to perform the service. So for example, if I wanted to use a cache to host my website, I would need to pay for it with a cache tokens. But a cache cannot sell me the tokens on their site like the stock photo site can, because in the absence of regulatory clarity, a cache has to assume that they're subject to things like money service business laws and blue sky laws, since there's a possibility that any leftover tokens could increase in value over time. So that means that I first have to go to an exchange to get the tokens that I need before I can purchase web hosting services from a cache, which adds an extra step of friction in their sales process and also means that they can't offer the convenience of a subscription service. And this friction makes it difficult for Web3 companies to compete with Web2 incumbents. Now, I fully acknowledge that this comparison isn't exactly apples to apples because there's no liquid second market for points from the stock photo site like there is for the Akash tokens. So it's much less likely for the extra points that I have from a stock photo site to have a fluctuating value than it is for the Akash tokens. So that's a significant differentiating factor. I mean, Technically, there are secondary markets for points. Sometimes people sell video game points on eBay and there are gift card exchanging platforms, but they're very niche and they don't have anywhere near the volume or volatility that token trading markets have. So I get why regulation to protect consumers from scams makes sense, but I don't see who gets harmed if they have points or tokens left over after using a service. The reason that a cache can't sell tokens to their users while a stock photo site can sell points is that the cache tokens could go up or down in value while the stock photos points won't. But if a user bought the tokens or points in order to use the service and they have some left over and the price changes, who does it hurt? If the token price decreases, but the user has already received the service that they bought the tokens for, there's no real loss. Just like there's no real loss when I have 35 useless stock photo points left over. And if the leftover tokens do go up in value, then it might cover their next purchase of cloud processing service, but I don't see the harm. I'm not a lawyer and I don't have a prescription for the best regulatory path forward to solve this problem. If you have suggestions, leave them in the comments below. I just know that this is an important issue that needs to be factored into regulation. The other issue I mentioned, machine to machine token controlled network orchestration is fundamental to whether or not Web3 decentralized protocols are able to operate in the US at all. This issue isn't necessarily unique to infrastructure, it spans the whole Web3 space. Most decentralized protocols have an aspect of machine to machine transactions. So let's consider another example. Let's think about a decentralized video app. Although the front end of the app that users interact with would be very similar to the video apps of Web2, the back end of the app would be built using decentralized open source protocols rather than centralized proprietary infrastructure. So even though the user experience would be the same where the user pays a $5 monthly subscription, the app would orchestrate the interaction between many decentralized protocols using tokens. So the user's initial $5 subscription would likely be paid in a value transfer protocol like Bitcoin, and then that Bitcoin would be exchanged automatically by the apps to pay for various decentralized protocols. When the user live streams a video, the app would need some live peer tokens to pay for the video transcoding. When the user leaves a comment, the app might need file storage tokens like Filecoin, Saya, Storage, or Arweave. Maybe the app itself is written as a smart contract and can deploy additional cloud processing when use of the app increases, in which case it would need tokens for the graph and a cache network. The point is that decentralized Web3 applications 
aren't possible without machine to machine token controlled network orchestration. And that means that regulation that lumps machine to machine value exchange in together with financial services that have user owned wallets and know your customer registration requirements would prevent the use of Web3 infrastructure. The bottom line is that the lack of clarity around what regulations apply to Web3 infrastructure and unpredictable enforcement against entrepreneurs building decentralized protocols is holding back the growth of Web3 in the US. The inventor of the web browser, Mark Andreessen, has said that the significance of blockchain technology is as big as the internet itself. The potential ahead for Web3 is enormous. If the US wants to remain the leader of the technology sector, it needs to provide the industry with clear and carefully constructed regulations that promote innovation and foster its growth. And that's it for today. If you think that the US needs regulatory clarity, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share the video. You can find me at Amy of Alexandria and follow the organization at Web3WG. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.